So when you see the idea that Home Secretary is coming up with here and you read what he's suggesting with these mm. ASBO style um, issues for knife crime, what are your initial thoughts? I think initially it feels that it's very reactive. So we've got some strategies that are in place that we're reacting to a situation as opposed to taking a proactive um, sort of viewpoint to it. On some of the incidents, I think there was one where they were saying children up until the, up to the age of 12 could now face um, custodial sentencing. I think it's the thing of we've got to look at the reasons why mm. children are carrying knives, the exposure that the young people now have to traumatic mm -hmm. events with knife crime, mm -hmm. seeing their friends being injured and seeing it continuously perpetuated on TV. Kyron was just 15 yes. years old when he was killed. Yeah. I mean, just an absolutely tragic loss of life. And we've seen teenagers too often affected by this sort of crime. Yeah. What happened when, when Kyron was attacked and died? So, on the <clears throat> night, um, he met up with two young men um, in Manchester, mm -hmm. Worsley Avenue. They, they were having a conversation on the high street and then the... the the three of them walked off the high street onto Worsley Avenue, mm. where they were seen on CCTV camera and standing at the corner of the road. Um, they were engaged in a discussion. We couldn't hear what the discussion was on CCTV. And Kyron was standing with his hands in his pocket. Mm. And he had a smile on his face. Mm. Um, so they weren't they, having an argument? They weren't having an argument. There wasn't any fight. There wasn't any form mm. of altercation. Um, the, young, the young man that stabbed him was texting on his mobile phone at the time. Mm. And um, the accomplice was kind of being a bit aggressive. So he's been a bit aggressive towards him in body language. But there wasn't any physical contact mm. at all. Um, the young boy, while he's texting, he looks up from his phone. Um, you just see his right hand raised in the air. He stabs Kyron into the chest, pulls it away, turns back to his phone, starts texting again, and he turns around and just walks away. The accomplice was standing at the time, and he's sort of looking on, looking at Kyron, but I think Kyron went into immediate shock. Yeah. So, at that point, he's still standing there with his hands in his mm -hmm. pocket. He <clears throat> looks as though he doesn't even realise he's been stabbed. When the accomplice runs away, Kyron walks out in the road, sort of staggers around a van, comes mm. back in and leans against a wall. When he leans against the wall, he's there with his head and he's trying to get into his bag. Um, then he looks up again and then he sort of looks up, steps back, pulls up his trousers and steps back out into the road. The two individuals are back, come back on camera again. This time, the individual that murders him seems a bit more angry, so it looks as though there's a bit more of a raised tone mm. going on, but again, mm. you can't hear the words. And the accomplice is holding a pole in his hand. Um, the, the main boy jumps on Kyron, stabs him again in the back, and then Kyron drops on the floor, jumps back up again, oh the two boys run away. Kyron sort of jogs a little, and then he walks to turn a corner, and that's where he fell. Rachel, no parent, no mother should have to know those details yeah. of what has happened to their child, because it should never have happened. No. Today, the Home Secretary wants to stop that happening to other parents. But from what you know about the specific details of what happened to your son, yeah. what would have stopped that crime, that murder and your loss happening? For me, the individual that stabbed Kyron, I feel that he was failed by the system initially because he was on a 12-month suspenditory order for another attack that he had done using a knife on somebody else. Mm. And he had carried out a robbery on somebody mm. also using a knife. Um, so the police simply, or the services, you think were not across his case? He shouldn't the, have been out with he, a weapon? No. And for <clears throat> in his case, yes, you know when they said that if you're caught with a knife... You, you get an immediate five years custodial sentence. But obviously, when it happens the first time, mm. you get sort of a slap on the wrist. And a, mm. But for the second time, then that should have been imposed mm. and he should have then been given that sentence. OK. Let's talk to Alison uh, Cope, who's in Birmingham for us this morning. Good morning to you, Alison. I'm sure you could hear Rachel mm. talking in vivid detail about what happened uh, tragically to Kyron in, in that sort of situation. Your yeah. son, Joshua, who's 18, is a bit older than Kyron, he was murdered in 2013. He was at a Birmingham nightclub, wasn't he? He was, he was performing at a fundraising event in honour of a young man who had been stabbed to death just a year earlier. What can you tell us about the evening that your son tragic, uh, tragically died? Um, Joshua performed at the event and he got into a minor argument with another 18-year-old boy. Um, that boy left 
the club and he was actually a knife carrier and he waited for Joshua. The argument escalated and Joshua was stabbed once in the heart and passed away seven hours later. So, yeah, a single stab wound and that was it. Joshua and this, died. So, so the, the knife carrier had been in the nightclub. Had he had the knife in the nightclub before he left as well? I don't know. I don't know. There was a lot of conversation around security, etc., mm. but uh, I don't actually know if he had actually come to the club with the knife. Alison, I know that <clears throat> you take um, your son's ashes with you and you go into schools and talk to young people and say mm -hmm. this is the consequence of yeah. knife crime. And, you know, such a powerful image and obviously, you know, completely encapsulates your loss and your attempt to try and fix this in the way that you can. But I'll put the same question to you that I put to Rachel because we're about to speak to the policing minister on behalf of the Home yeah. Secretary. What measures would have stopped <clears throat> the person responsible stabbing and killing your son? What should the Home Secretary be doing to prevent another mother talking to us on television about the loss of their child through knife crime? Um, I think the saddest thing about this whole situation is we are not going to stop young people being killed because we're leaving it too late and each time we have a conversation, people like myself, <coughs> um, people like your other guests are saying what they think but the government isn't taking any notice. We need young people to understand there are major consequences to carrying a knife and that's not the message they're receiving. They are receiving that if they're caught with a knife, it's unlikely they're going to get into serious trouble. We need to combine that with more police on the streets, more intervention for young people that are struggling and for families that are struggling and then we will start to see the amount of murders that are taking place in this country start to balance out and not increase because we're seeing a year-on-year -year increase because we are leaving it too late. Mm. In the following 12 months, there will be more mothers like myself, like your other guests, talking about the day their child was killed. And the longer the government leave it, the worse it's going to become. So hopefully, mm. the things that they're talking about actually happen mm. because I've had this conversation for five years and every few months I say the same thing and nothing happens, you know, young people are scared, they're on the street thinking they're in danger. Yeah. Again, as you know, your other guest said, they're exposed to so much and we're just allowing them to, to live in fear and we need to do so much more and we need to do it now, not when the knife crime figures increase, increase again and we just have a, you know, a conversation, yeah. yet we don't see any action. Alison, when you bring <clears throat> out your son's ashes in front of these young people, young men and girls, mm -hmm. but I imagine there are some of them knife carriers at certain times, does that stark reality of what you've shown, does that ever resonate? Do you ever get any feedback from them to say, I get this now, this makes much more sense, there's a tangible outcome to what I'm potentially putting myself or someone else through? What's their reaction? Totally. I mean, I get a, an amazing response because I'm making them think about themselves and about who their choices will affect. I don't talk about, you know, what could happen to them regarding the courts because they don't trust or believe that. But all of them, or most of them, have got someone at home. So if they want to leave the house with a knife, they need to understand the consequences of that. Yeah. Could be they don't ever see their mum again, their dad, their sisters, etc. The problem I'm finding day in, day out, is they leave the presentations thinking, I don't want this, I don't want mm. to be in this situation. But they don't know how to get out of it. They go back into an environment that they feel scared, intimidated, vulnerable and knowing that there aren't enough police on the street to make them feel secure and deal with the problems around them. So, again, coordinated okay. response. We all need to come together, work harder and make, you know, this better than it already is.